Amen. So you can keep something in Psalm 2 if you'd like. Um, I'm going to be just referencing that later. But uh, really where I would like to focus this morning is over in Luke chapter 12. So if you would turn over to Luke chapter 12. Again, you don't need to keep anything in Psalms 2. I'm just going to you know, quote that there. But you know, Psalms 2 is kind of the shorter passage compared to Luke chapter 12. So that's kind of what we did there. But uh, Luke chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verse 49. The title of this morning's sermon is A Fire Already Kindled. A Fire Already Kindled. So he says there in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? So Jesus there, you know, he's not just waxing eloquent. He's just not, you know, talking a big talk. He's speaking in very literal terms there. When Jesus says, I am come to send fire on the earth, you know, he's literally going to do that one day. Yeah. Uh, if you would, keep something in Luke chapter 12 for the rest of the sermon, but go over to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. The Bible predicts and tells us that there's going to be a time when this entire earth is consumed in flame, that it's going to be baptized with fire. You're going over to Psalm, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, it says in Psalm 97, a fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlightened the world, the earth saw it and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the whole earth. So again, this isn't just poetic talk. This isn't just something, you know, they're trying to make some kind of impression upon us through the use of, you know, uh, allegories and illustrations and these type of things. There literally is a fire that is going to go before the Lord one day. He literally is going to send fire upon the earth. And it says there in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, we, we can see that, where it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth, earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. So again, this is you know, talking literally that one, God, one day God is going to burn the elements of the earth. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ye ought to be in a holy conversation and godliness. So he's saying, look, you, this is going to happen, so consider what kind of person you need to be while you're here in all manner of godliness and holy conversation. Look at verse 12. Looking for and the hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So when Jesus is saying, I am come to send fire on the earth, that's just not big talk. That's really what he's going to do one day. Now, of course, at this time, we know he didn't do that. But here's the thing. He's coming back again. You know, he left for a while, but he's coming back. He is right. going to come, and he's going to send fire upon the earth. Not to, you know, we could talk about all the different ways that he's already kind of sending fire before him. We could talk about the fact that, you know, his, that, that hell is kindled by his very mouth. That, the, that, that people that are there are tortured in the presence of, of, of the Lamb and of the holy angels, the Bible says. Right. In his presence. You know, we hear people falsely say all the time that hell is separation from God. That's not true. Yep. That's not biblical. That's, right. That's just something that people like to say because they don't want to think about the literal fire that is there. It says that they have no rest day or night, and that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And it says that they are, they are tormented in the presence of the Lamb. Yep. So he's there. So there's another way we can talk about the fact that Jesus you know, is someone who is sending fire before him. We could talk about the two witnesses in Revelation, that fire was able to proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. You know, and, or Elijah, who of old you know, called down fire upon the 50s, and so on and so forth. But really, what he's saying here in the context of Luke chapter 12, what I want to focus in on is where he says, what if I, and what if I, excuse me, and what will I, if it be already kindled? He's saying, look, I'm coming to send fire on the earth. One day the elements will, will melt with a fervent heat. The heavens shall melt even, and all the elements of the earth. And what will I, if it be already kindled? He's saying, look, there's already a kindled, it's already kindled. You know, how much greater is it going to be if there's already a fire on this earth, in a sense? And he goes on there, and we'll get into it in a minute, where he talks about the division that, that, that he causes uh, amongst mankind. It should remind us, you know, if you read the context of that, that, those verses there. In fact, let's just read it. If you're there in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, go on in verse 50. He says, but I have a baptism where to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I have come to give peace on the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Mm -hmm. from, from, uh, it goes on in verse 52, For from thenceforth there shall be five in one household divided, 
three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So all these relationships, you know, and he doesn't, of course, name every single relationship. But one day I'm going to come and I'm going to send fire, and what if it be already kindled? <clears throat> it would should remind us of what we read in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 10. Turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. He said in Matthew chapter 10, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And people, uh, you know, sometimes they, they, they don't understand who Jesus really is. They don't understand this aspect of the Lord. <clears throat> he says there in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, And he that overcometh the keep of my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. So this is a you know this is something that we take hope in that one day we will be found worthy of being able to be one of those people that rule and reign with Christ. That one day he's going to say to his servants, "Be thou over ten cities, and be thou over five cities." And he's even saying here that some shall rule with a rod and iron with him, you know, in his stead, under his authority. So peace is coming to the earth. You know, everyone's clamoring for world peace and everyone wants just peace and, and, and who can blame them for that, right? But at what cost, you know, is what we have to ask ourselves. But make no mistake about it, peace is coming to the earth, but it's probably coming in a method that some people would rather it not. Some, in a method that some people just would not prefer it come. Because it says there when he's going to come, it's going to, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. That it's not just going to be, he's not going to come and negotiate with the nations. He's not yeah. going to sit down at the UN right. and work things out with everybody. It's going to be peace or else a rod of iron. You know, he's ruling with authority. Go over to Revelation chapter 19. I'll read you from Psalm 2 where uh, Brother Garza read this morning. It said in verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I mean, I, I, that's one thing I just love about the Lord is that he's not going to struggle to, you know, when he comes back, when he returns and sets up his millennial reign, it's not going to be this long, drawn-out press. It's going to be like you taking a rod of iron and just smashing a, 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 you know, a piece of clay with it. I mean, who was that, who's ever thought of that, just taking a bat and just, you know, go to town with the, at the you know, the, the bases and things, you know? How easily they break, you know? There's probably been people in here that have actually been horse playing or something in the house and actually knock one over you know, it was broke when I got here. <laughs> well, we see how easily these things are so brittle, they're so frail, they're so delicate, they're so easily just smashed. That's what's going to be like when Christ returns. I mean, he's going to come back and it's just going to be bam, in a sweep with just the words of his mouth. It's not going to be a struggle for him. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called, was called faithful and true, and in righteousness that he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but him, he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were, follow, which were in heaven followed, upon him, uh, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Hey, that's me and you. Yeah. That's one of the coolest things about the Bible. Sometimes you read these stories like, oh, that's me. Yeah. I'm going to be in that army. You know, that's, that's an amazing thought. He goes in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that, in, uh, that with it he should spite the nations and rule over them with what? A rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not going to struggle to do this. This isn't going to be difficult for him. Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Look, he's saying, I'm going to send fire upon the earth. I, I, I'm sending a sword now. Don't think I've come to send peace. I'm bringing division upon the earth. And one day I'm going to come and I'm going to sever the nations, the just from the unjust. And I'm going to dash some with a, with a, with a, with a rod of iron. <clears throat> Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. So who's going to be on the receiving end of this judgment, of this war that he is going to make? Look at verse 24. It says, and let us consider... One another to provoke into love and to good works, not forsaking and assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, 
but a certain fearful looking for uh, of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the enemies. Now he's not saying that people that he's describing in these prior verses are going to be, you know, devoured. He's saying they're going to have that same mentality, a certain fearful looking about for judgment and fire and indignation which shall devour the adversaries. The people that are going to be on the wrong end of that rod of iron are his adversaries, his enemies. And there are people today that are the enemies of God, that are opposed and that exalt themselves against everything that is called God. Yeah. And, and that's who's going to receive this fiery indignation that the Lord is going to bring. And what if it be already kindled? You know, there, there's already people that are, 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 are flaming those, the fans of that fire, of his fiery indignation. You know, they're making it even easier for him when he gets here to just go ahead and do what he wants to do. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'll read you from 2 Thessalonians 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So again, there are people that are going to have vengeance taken upon them with flaming fire. They that know not God, those that obey not the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's a big deal when somebody says, I'm not interested in hearing the gospel. I don't believe that. What you've done is you've made yourself of that number. And you say, well, now I'm the adversary of God. Now I'm going to be among those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so Jesus is saying here in Luke chapter 12, that this fire is already kindled. And how is it kindled? By the preaching of the gospel. That's one way. That's one way this fire has already been kindled upon the earth. I mean, that's what we read there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that those that obey not the gospel are those that are going to be have flaming uh, fire take vengeance on them. Right? And so Jesus is saying, look, this fire is already kindled by the preaching of the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which ca always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other are the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things. So I'm saying, look, we are a savor unto God. Either way, God is pleased by the savor that we are. And the people that are hearing the gospel preach to them, we are either a savor of death unto death unto them, or we are a savor of life unto life unto them. Right. Right. Some people hear the gospel and all they hear is the death. Yeah. Or the wages of sin is death. That's what they hear. And they say, whoa, I don't want that. And they reject it out of hand. So that becomes a savor of death unto death. Because they reject the gospel, they will face that eternal vengeance. That's right. They will face that being cast in the lake of fire. The dead are that where, where the dead go. So they are there. We are a savor unto those people uh, uh, unto death. But to the others, we are a savor of life unto life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life unto Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Some people hear the gospel and they hear the life. They hear about eternal life and they embrace it, yeah. and therefore they receive life. Sure. So it's a big deal to preach the gospel to somebody. You know, it's a big deal what people do with the gospel. It's either a savor of death unto death or of life unto life. <clears throat> but either way, God is pleased. And that's what it says there. He says, for we are unto God a sweet sight of savor of Christ and them saved and in them that perish. God just love, looks down and loves to see his children preaching the gospel. He says, I, that's what I want to see. That is a sweet savor unto me. Amen. <clears throat> Now, what I want to kind of point out here in this juncture is, look there at the end, it says, and who is sufficient for these things? You know, who, who, who can stand this? Who is, you know, uh, who is able to, to bear this? You know, who, who measures up to this? And what I want us to understand is that it's the gospel that is the offense. You know, Jesus, he came to send a sword, and he, you know, he, he brings division, but the word of God does that all on its own. You know, it's the gospel that is a savor of death unto death or of life on the life. It's not us. Who is sufficient for these things? I mean, which one of us is sufficient to, to, you know, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the Bible says. 
you know, who is sufficient for these things? You know, it's not us that's going to be the offense. It's not our personality. It's not who we are as a person. The offense that we bring to the world is the gospel itself. You know, if we just shut up and quit preaching the gospel and quit preaching the Bible, the world would get along with us. We wouldn't have to change anything else. Right. We wouldn't have to change the way we dress, the way we look. All we have to do is change the things that we say. All we have to do is change what we preach. Just close our Bibles, put them away, not mention anymore, and the world will just go right on its merry way and, and be more than happy to just take us arm in arm. Right. But that's not what we're here to do. It just goes to show us that it is the gospel that should always be the offense. It's the gospel that's going to help kindle that flame of vengeance. See, we're nothing special. If you go on there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, just flip over the page. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says in verse 4, verse 5, he answers this question, who is sufficient for these things? Not that we are sufficient of our, ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You know, we should never get this puffed up attitude and think, well, we're really something special because we're out preaching the gospel. I mean, it's a good thing that we're doing. You know, we're, would to God more people were doing it. But you know what? Our sufficiency is of God. It's God that's the offense. It's the, it's the gospel that has the power and not we ourselves. <clears throat> what, what are these things that help kindle this flame that, that, is, that has already been kindled? What are some of the things that are going to fan that flame, that are going to bring that division, that are going to bring that sword that Jesus said he was bringing? Well, one of them we just saw, you know, is by the preaching of the gospel itself. Just that, just in that one act, you know, you're going to separate people uh, for those that are going to die and not receive it, and those that are going to live unto life eternal. <clears throat> what about the living of a separated life? You know, people who get saved, you know, and, and we understand you don't have to live a separated life to get saved. You know, you can be saved and live however you want and go to heaven because, you know, salvation is by grace through faith. That's right. You know, it's, it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted to him for righteousness. Yep. And if you're counting in your works and your good life, you're not counting in Christ. You're counting in your own righteousness, which the Bible says is as filthy rags before God. Amen. So we understand that, right? But when a person gets saved, they decide, you know what, I'm going to live for the Lord. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start take reading the Bible and applying it to my life. I'm going to get in church, and I'm going to take the preaching. I'm going to do something with it. You know, that's another way to kind of fan this flame that is already kindled. <clears throat> Look there, if you would, at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, and when you get there, keep something there. We'll come back a little bit later. In 1 Peter chapter 4, I'll begin reading verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered us in the flesh, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that su hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walk in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He's saying, look, you've already had enough of that sinful life. You've already had enough of all these things. You know, you don't need to do that anymore. If you're saved, you need to just continue. You need to live for the Lord and not, you know, keep going on in, in this lasciviousness. We brought the will of the Gentiles. You know, if that be us, you know, hopefully, you know, there's a generation that comes up that says, no, I haven't done any of that. You know, not that they're going to be perfect or sinless, but there are people that, you know, Peter was addressing here that did live in all this, you know. They were living in all these lusts and these excesses and these banquetings and all these other things that they were into, these abominable idolatries. And look what he says in verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. He's saying, look, you came off from that. You're not doing those things anymore. But the people you used to party with, they're going, man, you changed. They think it's strange. What do you mean you're not coming over on Friday night? What do you mean you're not going to help me finish the six-pack? What do you mean you got a problem with the fact that we're, we're serving liquor at the family gathering? Right. You know, what do you mean you got a problem with all this? You're, what's the matter with you? You changed. You know, I'll never forget when I first got saved, I, and here's a, kind of getting ahead of myself, you know, I didn't have to go really broadcasting it to my family. You know, I got saved when I decided to finally start living for the Lord. It, it came pretty obvious pretty quick because I quit doing a lot of things that I 
was doing. And I'll never forget one of my relatives coming to me and saying, you know what? The, the old you would make fun of the you today. <laughs> and she was right. right. So the old you used to make fun of people like the you of today. Mm-hmm. And just thinking, oh, it's just a matter of time. You're just on some kick. Right. You know, you're just on some bandwagon. You'll fall off. You'll be back. I'm not going to say I was perfect the whole time and to have, you know, make mistakes along the way, but I think, you know, they could look at my life now and say, well, I guess it's not just some kick. Yeah, amen. Right. You know, it's not, you know, nearly two decades later, it's not just some bandwagon I'm on that I actually believe these things, you know, that I actually want this for my life. <laughs> and he's saying here, look, when you do that, people are going to think, that's strange. That's weird. And what are they going to do? They're going to speak evil of you. And what is this? This is that division. This is that flame that has been kindled on earth that Jesus brought, which is just a, a taste of what's coming. That he's saying, look, when you, I'm, bringing, I'm kindling this flame. It's going to cause division so that we can know who the people of God are and who they aren't. And he's separating people even now through the preaching of the gospel, through the living of a godly life. Go over to Luke chapter, back to Luke chapter 12. He said in verse 49, I am come to send fire on the earth. <clears throat> And what will I if it be rekindled, but I have a baptism uh, where to be baptized? Well, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna read from Matthew 10. I, I referenced that earlier. But this is, you know, this is a very similar thing to what he said in Matthew chapter, chapter 10, verse 35. He said, For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against his mother, the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own house. They of his own household. You know, you get saved, you start living for God, you know what you're going to find out is that the whole family is going to just jump on board and say, this is great. Where's this been all my life? No, they say, man, keep that, keep your religion. Yeah. You know, we don't want to hear about it. They want to just keep right on going with what they were doing, keep on going in the same sense, and if you don't go along with them, well, you know what, you're just kind of, you're just kind of, you're cramping my style. You know, they don't come around. Go live your weird life with your weird new friends. That's the kind of things they say, that's how they think. <laughs> they think it's strange, is what it says. <clears throat> you know, I remember, you know, going. I'm just kind of reflecting here, thinking about when I got saved. And I, you know, I had a friend who called me out, you know, because I started talking about, man, I went, I got saved. I started talk, trying to talk about the Bible a little bit, and he's like, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I see what you're doing, and it's two different things. <laughs> and he's like, everybody's kind of talking about it. You should probably pick one or the other. Right. That's right. What he didn't see coming was I ditched them. <laughs> Said, all right, I'll pick one. I'll go with Jesus. Amen. I'll go with the Bible then. You can you can have your your parties and everything that goes along with it. <clears throat> because I have enough of that. And every all the all the you know just the 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 the, the, the uh, just the sin and the consequences and the negative effects that comes along with living that life. You know, and I'll say this. You know, even a, since getting saved and living for the Lord. My worst days are, are still better than a lot of my best days as an unsaved yeah. heathen. You know, right. it's, it's true. Mm-hmm. But what am I saying here? He's saying, look, he's setting, this, he's setting this fire. There's a fire to come, and this flame has already been kindled by the fact that Jesus brings the vision. Just like that fire is only going to devour you know, a certain group of people, those that oppose God, those that obey not the gospel, the unsaved. That's where we're going to suffer that eternal vengeance. And he's sending division through these different means, through the preaching of the gospel, through living a holy life. <clears throat> so this division, this division, you know, this variance, as he calls it, is a fire that's already kindled. Okay? And here's really what I want to drive in at this morning, is that that fire is kindled without any help from any of us. You know, we should, we should really kind of hold back from just trying to go through life, try to see how big we can make that flame ahead of time. You know, there's a big enough flame coming. There, you know, Jesus is going to devour the whole earth in fire. You know, that flame will grow naturally. It'll, it will spread on its own in our own lives. We don't have to go out of our way to try and divide people from us and try to offend people with, you know, with the Bible. Okay. Now, I'm not against, you know, standing your ground and, and saying what needs to be said and making things clear to people. But on the other hand, you know, we're, we're, I see a lot today, uh, you know, especially in the area of social media, where it seems like people are just trying to fan a flame 
that doesn't really need any help. It's already there. It'll grow on its own. It's a fence all of itself. <laughs> you know, the, the passive aggressive social media post. This is like one of the, this is just such an easy dead ringer target whenever you talk about this type of thing because there's just so much of it out there. And, you know, let me, this is just something I, I got to say because I, I, I see it and I, over and over again. And I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again is that, you know, it's appreciated when people, uh, you know, when somebody goes on social media and they rail on a man of God and they say pastor so-and-so or whoever it is that you're affiliated with, you know, and, and, they, and they go after them and they attack them, you know, you don't have to come running to their rescue on social media. Did you know that? You know, I, I've had people like, I remember saying this because people started, they left a few comments on our channel. And I'd go through and I'd read it. Someone would make some snarky remark about the way I look or something like that. You know, and we all know it's true. Right? <laughs> but somebody, somebody's got to jump and be like, hey, let me defend Brother Corbin here. It's like, I appreciate it, but I'm not looking for it. And I really, you know, quite frankly, don't need it. <clears throat> that kind of a thing. But, uh, you know, the other thing is just, well, let me just post this just to see who I can trigger. Let me just post this so I can see if somebody's just going to get angrier and angrier. Let me just try and fan this flame that I got going to see how big I can get it. You don't need to do that. How about, you know, we start berating the unsaved for not living a godly life? You know, we see some unsaved person. You know, we see this all the time about knocking doors. You know, someone will come, come to the door and you're like, whoa, you're just not trying to let it show on your face. <laughs> You're just trying to be like, hi, I'm from a Baptist church. Maintain eye contact, maintain eye contact. And they look like they trip and fell into a tackle box. Someone's just been using them as a sketch pad for however long. You know, they, the kids got a hold of some spray paint and just went to town in the hair. They're wearing something that's probably like made for somebody four times smaller than them. They're hanging out all over the place in front of God and everybody. We run into this type of thing. Right. Or somebody comes to the door and they're just, just in a really bad, sad state. I mean, sin's just got a hold on them. You know, it'd be really easy just to get a real cynical attitude. It's like, can you believe that guy? Can you believe the way she looked? You know, I know I'm up here kind of doing it, but <laughs> we don't do that out there. We don't go out there and just be like, man, I'll talk to you when you kind of, you know, I can stand to look at you. You know, and just berate people because they're not living as godly a life as we are. You know, giving this holier-than-thou attitude. We shouldn't berate the unsaved. You know, try to fan that flame that's already kindled. Look, they've already got something coming. You know, and I'll, and I'll say this. This might surprise some people. And, I, you know, this is just a preference. This isn't something that, you know, I'm saying anybody has to have, be this way. This is something I've kind of heard other people talk about. And I've kind of developed a, this a little bit. You know, the, the queer waiter, right? You go to the waiter, you go to the, you go to the, the, whole, the uh, restaurant, and you got, you know, you got the fag coming serving your food. Now that can ruin your meal, you know. And there's way to, ways to handle, it, but sometimes you're just kind of stuck with that person, right? I'm not going to go out of my way to try and make them have a miserable experience, because I know what's coming to them, and that they're beyond hope. The Bible teaches that's another sermon. Yeah. You know, I can get through a meal, and I can I can do all that without letting them know that I would rather the earth just opened up underneath their feet right. at that exact moment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They've got it. It's bad enough for them. It's coming. At least, you know, at the very least, uh, just let them go through this life. You know, we can't do anything about it anyway. So I'm not just going to go out of my way to just, you know, berate them, un, you know, unnecessarily. Now I get it. Sometimes we have to let it out. <laughs> sometimes it's just got to, ah, you know, and it's, it's hard to just uh, take it. Right. But that, you know, that's the world we're living in, folks. Mm -hmm. And if we just wanted to go around berating every unsaved person that we come across for what they're involved in, you know, that, that'd be a miserable existence. Mm -hmm. You know, just getting, you know, trying to defend every, right every wrong on the internet, rebuke every homeless bum who just needs to get up off his feet and go get a job at every intersection. You can go horse in this town right. trying to do that. You know, this division, this variance that Jesus brought, brings just by who he is, just by the word of God itself, this flame that is already kindled in this world, it, it grows and it arises just as naturally now 
as it did in Cain and Abel's day. I mean, we think about that. Think about the fact that, you know, did Abel have to go out of his way to get Cain to rise and slay him? No. He just did what was right. Yeah. You think he walked by with that lamb and looked at his vegetables and was like, good luck with that. No, man, he was just worried about making sure he was right and doing the right thing. And when he found out that, that God had rejected his older brother's offering of, of fruits and vegetables, and he said, you know, when God said, take this vegan mess away from me, right? <laughs> right? You think he went, nay, nay, boo, boo. God's not mad with you. God's not as pleased with you as with me. Did he do that? No. I'm saying he just went about his business, made his sacrifice, went back to his flock, was just doing what he needed to do, living his life. And just as that, that flame is already kindled. And, it, you know, and, of course, we know the story. It says in 1 John 3, This is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because of the, the relentless taunting and berating that, that Abel you know, inflicted upon him day by day. No, it wasn't that. Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Just by living that righteous life, just by living and doing what God said, that was enough to just trigger Cain to the point that he was ready to kill him. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to get across this morning, is that we don't have to go out of our way to offend people unnecessarily. Now, I'm not saying don't offend people at all costs. You know, if you're just going about your business and living your life and, and saying what you have to say offends people, so be it. You know, I'm not saying we need to turn in a bunch of PC snowflakes or something like that. But all I'm saying is we need, to, we need to have some discernment and check ourselves. Am I just fanning a flame here for no other reason to see how big I can get it? Or is there really a reason I'm taking this stand? So it arises just as naturally as it did in Cable's day, Abel's day. He said, you know, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. You know, the world's going to hate you just... Just for the sake of the fact that you read the Bible, believe the Bible, you preach the Bible, that's enough right there to just fan that flame. You know, and, and, and just in case we haven't caught on here, you know, the unsaved friends and family that we have, you know, they are of the world. So don't let it surprise you when even your own friends and your own family, you know, they don't go to the, of course, the, the extreme Cain did, but they will hate you. It might just cost you something. I'm not saying to back down and not take your stand when it's appropriate and let the word of God be an offense. And, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you about that. I mean, I've got, I've got a relative that because of the preaching of the word of God said, I don't want anything to do with you. And they cut me off. You know? And they kind of spared, saved me the trouble a little bit. Because it was headed that way anyway. But what did I do? Oh, well, you know, let me, let me explain my, let me apologize for what the pastor said. No way. Yeah. I told him, well, what the pastor said was Bible, and I don't apologize for it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I said, well, I don't want anything to do with you. So see you later. Yep. And I'll tell you something. I didn't have to go out of my way. Hey, did you hear what my pastor said? Hey, did you, did you hear the sermon? I didn't have to bring it to some unsaved relative and put it in their face and say, let me see if this offends you. Let me see if I can fan this flame. <laughs> it just happened of its own accord. I didn't have to go out of my way. So, you know, that's really the thrust of this message this morning. And it's not a long sermon, okay? It's going to be a, a shorter one, but that's real. I think it's an important truth that we need to understand. Amen. That Jesus said, it's already kindled. You know, hey, I'm, I'm going to bring the judgment. I'm going to bring the fiery indignation. People are going to be consumed with, you know, an eternal vengeance and flaming fire. The end of the wicked is a horrible end. You know, and, and I'm glad God's God, you know, because I don't know that I could do that to those people, to be quite honest. I'm not saying that I'm right and he's wrong. I'm just saying, you know, if it were up to me, I'd probably try to get, I would say just, you know, it'd be like when you're playing dodgeball, you know, and you get down to last place and the guy calls out, jailbreak, and everybody gets to jump back in. I'd probably be the guy who yells out, jailbreak, let him out, you know, forgive him, just let him out, you know, they, they've just suffered long enough. But that's not right. You know, our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Right. And when we get to heaven and we have the mind of Christ, I'm sure it'll make, I'll say, you know what? I was, 
you know, I'll, I'll totally understand it and say they, they are completely, they deserve to be there. Yeah. Just like the rest of us, by the way. Yeah. Right. You know, <clears throat> we're just saved by grace, yeah. something you don't deserve. Yeah. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that end is already there for these people. I don't have to make my life's goal, you know, about reminding them of that fact. Or, you know, seeing how offensive I can be with the Word of God. It's, it's offensive enough on its own. So rather than, you know, going out of our way to just stoke these flames, just getting out the billows and shh, 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 and whatever area of life that we do that, you know, stoking this flame, that's one day going to consume everything that exists. Everything that you see just turn to ash. We should probably show some compassion and patience for people. That's really what we need to do. Because we understand the flame's there. This flame is already kindled. The offense comes naturally. We know what the end is. So in the meantime, rather than just going through our life trying to stoke that flame, let's actually show some compassion and patience towards people and try to pull them out of the fire. And understand something, that when people are rejecting the gospel, when they're rejecting Christ, or they're respect, rejecting what, something that the Bible says, they're not rejecting you. Sure, they might be projecting their offense, they might be projecting their objections towards you because that's who they have an argument with, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they're rejecting Christ. Right. They're rejecting the Bible. And you can't reject something in the Bible and say, I believe the Bible. Right. You either believe the Bible or you don't. Right. That's right. And that's, that's, you know, that's kind of another sermon too. But that's what I want us to understand, is that, look, this flame is it's kindled, it's coming, but it shows some compassion, Understand that if the offense comes for the gospel's sake, they're rejecting Christ, not you. He said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus says, you know, I'm first. You know, I, I've already been there. I've already been around that block. You know, the world hates you, and we feel like we're all alone. We're, we're being persecuted for the Lord's sake. Well, you know what? Welcome to the club, is what Jesus says. Yeah. Welcome to the club. And guess who's the president of that club? The Lord. I mean, until they've drug you out and arrested you and, you know, spat in your face and pulled out your hair and whipped you and crucified you, you know, I don't know that you've really suffered to his degree that he has. And no one ever will, because we know there's a lot more to that as well. So that should neither surprise, that should not surprise us, right, when the world hates you. That's what he's saying there. If the world hates you, you know, you know that it hated you before, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You know, that's going to come naturally. That's not, we don't have to go out of our way to make that happen. All we have to do is just go about our lives and live a life for Christ and just walk. The offense will come for the word's sake by and by. <clears throat> so that shouldn't surprise us, but on the other side, it shouldn't be a source of pride either. Now, he does say, you know, we should rejoice when men, you know, uh, blessed are you, men shall revile you and persecute you. And shall sell all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your word in heaven. We should rejoice, but we don't need to wear that like a badge of honor, you know, and go around and try to show everybody how persecuted we are. You know, or, or how we turn this, you know, we got a thousand comment thread going back and forth with a bunch of atheists or something. I don't know what an exact, you know, exact good illustration would be, but I think you get my point is that we don't need to turn this into a source of pride of how persecuted we are. I'm so persecuted. You should see my, my social media accounts. I've been banned so many times from Facebook. It's like, oh man, you go to that, you know? <clears throat> There's no need to, to doubt, to, to, to stoke this flame with people. We should show compassion. That's what I want to get across here. And because here's the thing, that flame's killed, that fire's coming. Do we want to just sit there and pour gas on them and be like, oh, take that. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 4 if you're still there. Did I have to keep something there? Probably not. 1 no. Peter chapter 4. Actually, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll start wrapping this up. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm going to read to you. It says, For as much then Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has seed from sin that he should no longer live there in the, in, in the rest of his time and left to the will of men. He said in verse 4, Wherein they think it strange that you run not to the same, uh, with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. 
And we were talking about some people are gonna be like, man, what's you changed? You know, we could get offended at that and be like, yeah, you better believe I changed and you need to change and we could get all puffed up and proud about it. But here's the thing. It's that, you know what the Bible says of those people? Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. You know, they might think it's strange. They might, they might even speak evil of us. But you know what? They're all going to give an answer to him one day, to the Lord. And he'll judge them. Our job in the meantime is to have an attitude of compassion towards those people. You know, not just go out of our way to see how many family members or friends or co-workers that we can just, you know, aggravate to where they are pushed away for the wrong reasons. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 23. He said, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strikes. You know, that would probably knock out 90% of online debates right there. People would just enact that. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Must not. You want to serve God? Don't strive with people. Now, I understand we need to contend for the faith. There's a time and place. But I think, I, I wonder sometimes if a lot of the, the, the so-called contending we're doing is really just us striving unnecessarily. Instead of showing an attitude of compassion. As it says here, being gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those. That's a real, that's the litmus test right there. When you're, you know, going back and forth with somebody, you know, look inwardly and say, is this coming from a place of pride? Or is this coming from a place of meekness? Is this coming from a place where I'm trying to help them and instruct them? Am I being patient? Or am I just, you know, not listening and waiting to see how quickly I can respond and kind of get the, aha, you know, everyone's trying to, up, you know, I'll do the other one. You know, I'm going to burn you. You got no comeback kind of thing. And that's the wrong place. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna contend with people, you know, we need to do it in the right manner. Why? In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Isn't that what we want? Right. Check your motive. Why why are you going about striving with people? If we're striving with someone, that's another thing we need to check. What's my motive here? Is that that they'll repent and get right with God? Or is it just so I can say, well, I won that debate? Well, I guess I'm right. right. I want to hear you say, well, I guess you're right. I'm wrong. Is that the goal? Or is it that God will give them independence to the acknowledging of the truth? Amen. Because that flame's already kindled. We'd rather have them repent and not have the... T- you know, when, 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 he, when he pours out the gasoline. Right. <clears throat> that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know, we'd probably be a lot more compassionate with unsaved people if you could see them in that light of verse 26. People that are in the snare of the devil and are taken captive by him at his will. The best way I've ever heard this illustrated, you ever see a cat play with a mouse that's caught? A lot of times cat will, a cat will catch a mouse. It isn't just, you know, thrash it and kill it. It'll play with it for a while. Let it go and catch it again. Throw it up in the air. It'll play with that thing. That's what the devil does with some people. They think they're getting away. Oh, take them back, thrash them a little bit, throw them around. That's what unsaved, the unsaved, that's what their life is like, folks. And when they start to get a little light, they start to get a little understanding, they're trying to go in the right direction, they're trying to understand the gospel or some biblical truth or something like that. And then we come along and, you know, sometimes our attitude, we just kind of, you know, hold them up for the cat. Say, here he is. You know, they've got a hard enough time. We should be trying to reach out in compassion, you know, and, and, and help these people. And again, here's all, the, this is a great checklist. If we find ourselves striving, let's go through this list and see if it's coming from a place of meekness. What's our attitude and what's our motive? So the purpose of this message is kind of twofold this morning. And, you know, first of all, don't be surprised when you heat, feel the heat from that flame that's already been kindled in your life. You know, we're all going to experience that at some point or another. If you're going to live for the Lord, you will suffer persecution. Yea, and all they that will live godly with Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. They didn't say they might. They didn't say there's a good chance. He said they shall. So just be prepared for that. That one day you, you're, you're going to feel that heat if you're going to live for the Lord. Because that flame's already kindled. But understand this, when you feel that, that God is going to fan that thing plenty on his own one day. 
And when we feel that, we go, oh, there's that heat. Let me just blow on that and see how big I can get it. That should not be our attitude. Now, again, I'm not saying don't stand your ground. I'm not saying compromise what you believe or back down and, 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 and stand up for what's right. Because here's the thing, you know, and I don't mean this in a haughty way. We have the higher ground. It's a fact. Because we have the Bible on our side. Yeah. You know, we're, we're on the, the rock and everybody else is on the shifting sands. You know? We have the higher ground. We just do. Again, not because of who we are, but because of who the Lord is and what he's done in our life by saving us and, and teaching us these things. Amen. But what do you want to use that higher ground for? Just look down on people? You know, see if I can hop a luge on them? <laughs> you know? Just tease them. Oh, look out! You know? Laugh at them when they're, when they're sinking. You know, and instead of us standing on a higher end, just kind of puffing out our chest, look where I am, everybody. Look how far I made it. What's wrong with you? That should not be our, our attitude should be. Let me help you up here. Let me see if I can get you where I am. That needs to be our motive. Let's pull people up to where we are. Help them to, to get on that rock too. I should have had you over to Jude. We're going to close there. Jude chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 21. Jude 1, 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And that's, a, that's a good attitude to have when you're out soul winning. Keep yourself in the love of God out there, folks. That's a good attitude to have towards people in our lives. Keep yourself in the love of God and look for mercy for the Lord. You know, pray that God would grant them mercy unto eternal life. And of some having compassion, making a difference. You know, you bending down from that higher ground, you don't know what kind of difference that might make. There might be somebody looking up, wanting to be where you're at. Just looking for a helping hand, someone to show some compassion and pull them out of that fire. But again, he says here, and others with fear. There is a time and a place to say, hey, what you're involved in is damnable. What you're involved in is false. What you're involved in is going to take you to hell and you need to get rid of it. We understand that. But there's a time and place, and there's a way to do it, and it has to be with the right motive and in the right way. And he says, others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God and our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. So we need to learn to use discernment to know which is appropriate this morning. Do they need to be shown compassion? Or do they need to have some fear? Which is it? Well, we have to have discernment to know which is appropriate. And we need to use discernment and knowing that, you know, uh, that he made us faultless before his presence. You know, it's the Lord that made us faultless. We didn't get there on our own. Right. And not to have this puffed up, haughty attitude but to, to, to have compassion on people. You know, it's, he's the one that made us faultless. And therefore, you know, he's the one that gets all the glory and the praise and the honor, and the majesty and the power and the dominion and the riches and everything, so on and so forth, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> and that's my message this morning. You know, let's, let's have some compassion on the, on, the, on, the, on the unsaved and those about us. Let's not just go through life trying to fan a flame that is already kindled that God one day is going to fan himself. In the meantime, let's use discernment and let's pull people out of that flame. Let's go ahead and pray.